just uh, ordered the book. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have time. <laughs> okay, great. Awesome. Okay. okay, hi everybody. Welcome to another um, English class here on Verbling.com. My name is Lisa and I'm one of the English teachers here at Verbling. And in this hour, we're going to be having a reading class. It's a pretty long article, actually. It's a science topic, some new discoveries in the biotech industry. So we're going to be reading this article uh, together so I can help you understand it and uh, we can understand what's going on. This is the article in the businessinsider.com, uh, but I also want to give you the link that I have for the document um, in the Google Drive. So... Let me give that here too. Okay, so um, if you have a reservation for this hour, then you can use it now. If you don't have a reservation but you want to join us, just wait a minute um, and then when you see the join class button, you can join. If you're a Verbling member, you do have to be a Verbling member. If you aren't yet a Verbling member, you can join um, with the free trial for seven days. Um, and then after the seven days, if you want to continue, then your credit card will be charged $45, and that's $45 per month, and you get to take as many classes as you want. So, And you can also take Spanish classes, too. <laughs> we have some students who are learning English and Spanish. So, um, Emre Khan, what, let's talk about India for a minute <laughs> while we're waiting for people to join us. When was the last time that you went to India? I, last summer, in June, July, I was there, but mm -hmm. uh, in actually in May, I was there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes. <laughs> how, how many times have you been to India? Uh, three times. Wow. Uh, yes, this is not my first time, mm -hmm. uh, but last summer they relocated uh, to Malaysia from oh. India. I went to Malaysia to follow them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. Uh, yes, it is a, a beautiful world. <laughs> <laughs> I really like India. Uh -huh. Now they come back to India, I will go in May again. Oh, great. And um, how's the weather when you go? Is it hot or is it nice climate? Or? Yeah, it's hot, it's hot <laughs> because yeah. Goa is the south of India. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> mm, so it is really hot. <laughs> mm -hmm. Wow, cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have several uh, people that I know, some friends who have gone to India over the years for different uh, types of practices, yoga practices, spiritual practices. Yeah, that's cool. All right, well, let's see. Let's welcome everybody else who's coming in. Hi, Antonio. Welcome. Hello, Lisa. Hello, everyone. Hi. And uh, Monica. Hi, Monica. Hi. Welcome. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. Starting my week, Monday morning. It's not too early. It's 10, 10 a.m. for me. Uh, but it's good, oh. yeah. And uh, I'm ending my more my day. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. How was your day? Did you have a nice day? Oh yes, uh, day at work. Uh, same old, same old. <laughs> same old, same old. <laughs> okay, good. And Israel, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Okay, good. And Hamid's joining us. Hi, Hamid. Hi. Okay. All right, you guys. Well, let's get started because um, this article is actually pretty long, and I'm thinking that I'm going to just um, have you guys read, and then I'll explain things, and I might also uh, give you some feedback on your pronunciation. So if I hear you say something and I want to correct it, I'll, I'll tell you about that too. But uh, it's pretty long, um, so hopefully we'll be able to finish it. If not, if you want to finish it on your own, uh, you can if it's interesting to you. Um, this is article I took from uh, the Business Insider magazine, businessinsider.com, but it's been um, in a lot of different places. So it's a new uh, discovery that they've been talking about, and these guys just got an award for their research. So it's it's online here that I where I took it, but um, I also saw this same story on many you know many different other uh, websites. So it's it's in the news 
right now. Um, it's pretty big. It's a big uh, biotech discovery, so you, uh, you know technology related to humans and, and animals, but in related to biology, living things. Um, and so it's about to change medicine. That's the idea here. So a pretty big breakthrough. Um, and we're going to try to understand it. I am not a scientist myself, so maybe Hamid or other people might help us understand it. But I think the basic idea we'll understand and uh, obviously we'll be uh, practicing English as well. <laughs> so we, get, we say kill two birds with one stone. We'll uh, learn some new English and also learn about something new perhaps to us in terms of this new discovery. Okay, so why don't we start with Monica and I'm going to give you guys um, a, kind of a, a longer passage each as well so we can read through this. Like I said, it's a pretty long article. So Monica, why don't you uh, get us started with that part there. Okay. On November evening last year, uh, Jennifer Donna put on a stylish black evening gown and headed to Hangar One, a building at NASA's um, Ames Research Center that was constructed in 1932 to house the dirigibles. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce. <laughs> That's right, dirigibles, yeah. Under the looming arch of the hangar, Donna mingled with celebrities like Benedict Cumberbatch, Cameron Diaz, and John Hamm before receiving the 2015 Breakthrough Prize in Life Sciences an award sponsored by Mark Zuckerberg and other tech billionaires. Dodna, a biochemist at the University of California, Berkeley, and her collaborator Emmanuel Charpenter of the Helmholtz Center for Infection Research in Germany, each received three million for her $3 million for their invention of a potentially revolutionary tool for editing DNA known as crisps. Donna was not a gray-haired emerita being celebrated for work she did back when dirigibles ruled the sky. <laughs> okay, good. All right, so now I'll uh, start. So the, the first part is you get an image of uh, what's happening, and we see that here in this uh, picture here. So they put on a black gown. They're going to a special awards uh, ceremony. And so this happened in November uh, last year. Uh, stylish black evening gown, that's just the dress that she wore. It looked very nice and stylish. And they were headed to Hangar 1. So headed to means going to. That's where they were going. And Hangar is a big building that um, airplanes are stored in. That's where they're located when they're not in use. And this was at NASA, so the space uh, station here in the United States in Florida where they uh, used to let off the rockets and stuff, shoot off the rockets. So uh, it was constructed a long time ago, 1932, and it was for dirigibles, which is, is not a very common word unless you know about you know uh, past um, uh, types of ships and airplanes and things like that. But it's an air, it's a type of older style airship. Um, okay, so under the, the looming arches, the arches are the the things that come together. McDonald's has the golden arches. <laughs> that's what they call the, the M there. And, uh, that's the shape of an arch, uh, one side of the M. Um, but looming means they're very big. So the, these huge arches, um, they were mingling. So when you mingle with, you got to use those two uh, together. To mingle with people means to mix, to talk. To, you, know, you talk to this person, then this other person. So they were there among celebrities. And they were receiving this uh, breakthrough prize. So a breakthrough is something new. So they're receiving a prize for life sciences, which includes uh, biology. And this award was sponsored by Mark Zuckerberg, one of the founders of Facebook, sorry, Facebook, and other tech billionaires. Tech, short for technology. All right. So this lady uh, is a biochemist at University of California in Berkeley. Uh, and her collaborator means her partner in terms of work, her co-worker, her colleague. Um, they each got $3 million for their invention. So this is the, the important part here. They found this uh, uh, tool 
for editing DNA. So it's called, I don't know how they say it, I would say CRISPR, maybe CRISPR, those, stand, those letters stand for something, but uh, just that's an acronym, CRISPR, and it's potentially revolutionary. So it's possible that it could, we say, revolutionize medicine. So imagine that they're going to be able to edit your DNA, you know, human being's DNA. That's the idea. Um, Dudna was not a gray-haired, so that means she's not old. <laughs> she hasn't been around a long time. She's a young person. Emerita is referring to the type of uh, professor that you are. If you're a professor emeritus, it means that you've been around for a long time and you're honored. She's, you know, she's a young person is basically what this wants to say here. But she's being celebrated for. So she's being recognized for her work. Um, that she she did back when, uh, or sorry, um, she was not being celebrated. So there, basically this line is just saying she's a young person and she's doing new work. So it's kind of a juxtaposition of where they, they are. Okay, if you guys have any questions, I'm going to go through this kind of quickly because we have a lot to cover. Hopefully, as I explain, it will help you uh, understand the sentences better. But if you have a question if, and you want me to explain something in a different way, or I didn't explain something, just make sure your microphone is unmuted and then you just ask, okay? Um, hi, Diana, welcome. Hi, how are you? <laughs> I'm good, thanks. We just got started. Okay, so basically they're at this event, they're getting an award for this amazing new uh, process of editing DNA. That's the main idea here, editing DNA. So Israel, you can read these next uh, sentences here, these paragraphs. <laughs> It was early in 2012 that Drona, Charpentier, and their colleagues offered the first demonstration of Christ's potential. They craft uh, molecules. molecules that could enter a microbe and precisely snip its DNA at the location of the Richard's choosing. In January 2013, the scientists went one step further. They cut out a particular piece of DNA in human cells and replaced it with another one. In the same month, separate teams of scientists at Harvard University and the Broad Institute reported similar success with the gene editing tool. A scientist, Stampede, mm -hmm. comments, and in just the past two years, researchers have performed hundreds of experiments on CRISP. Their results hint that the technique may fundamentally change both medicine and agriculture. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Now we're uh, getting to know what they did. So um, this sentence was saying, you know, she's not old and she wasn't working back when these dirigibles ruled the sky. So when they were being used, uh, maybe in warfare or something like that. Um, so it was only a couple of years ago, basically, is what they're saying. Only a couple of years ago, uh, Dudna and her colleagues, her co-workers, people, her fellow researchers, we say they offered or they gave the first demonstration where they showed what this uh, technique could do, what the potential, you know, what it could possibly do in the future. Um, CRISPRs, that's the, the name there. They crafted molecules, all right, so they crafted, they created, they made some molecules, that's a scientific term, we're thinking very small things that we can't really see with our eyes. <laughs> Okay, so uh, they crafted these molecules that could enter a microbe, so a living microorganism, so going into like the cells, for example, and precisely, means very, you know, specifically, very detailed, they would snip, which means to cut. So it could go in and cut like a, you know, like a remote control or something, it sounds like. They can go in and cut a DNA, you know, some genes, at a location where the researchers wanted it, so of the researchers choosing. So wherever they wanted to go, they could go there, 
and snip a little portion of DNA and that's pretty amazing that's the idea of editing alright so then a year later they went one step further so that means they did whoa sorry uh, they did something else you know one step the next step in this thing they cut out a particular piece of DNA in a human in some human cells and then they replaced it with another one so this is the idea of editing so you're taking out some some little parts of human DNA and putting in or replacing it with another one so you can imagine the consequences this could have for designing humans create you know helping with diseases all these types of things that have um, people have been talking about all right they also uh, another separate team of scientists did something uh, very similar so they reported similar success with the gene editing tool so this is the CRISPR editing tool they're talking about so what happened was a scientific stampede commenced so stampede we usually think of like when you let a bunch of horses out of a stable and they start running you know that's called a stampede like a bunch of animals stampeding um, but in this case it's a bunch of scientists <laughs> and they're like running to try to you know figure out how to use this tool and what they can do so it's like a lot of the idea is a lot of scientists are interested and that's uh, when it started so once they found out about this a lot of scientists have wanted to do this type of research so they have they have performed or conducted or um, made you know hundreds of experiments or undergone or something like that you can use lots of different words um, their results their findings you know the things that they were able to achieve hint or give us a clue that this technique may fundamentally means at the core change both medicine obviously for diseases and agriculture so how how we grow plants and animals uh, living organisms things like that so pretty a new uh, technology that could have a big impact on the future. Okay, Hamid. Some scientists uh, have repaired uh, defective DNA in mice, for example, curing them of uh, genetic disorders. Uh, plant uh, scientists have used uh, CRISPR to edit GANs in crops, raising hopes that uh, they can engineer a better food supply. Some researchers are trying to rewrite uh, to genomes of elephants with the ultimate goal of uh, recreating o a woolly mammoth. Writing last year in the journal Reprodu Reproductive uh, Biology and Endocrin Endocrinology, uh, Motoko Araki and uh, Tetsuya Ishii of uh, Hokkaido University in Japan predicted that doctors will be able to use CRISPR to alter the gains of human embryos in the immediate uh, future. Thanks to the speed of uh, CRISPR research, the accolades have come quickly. Last year, MIT Technology Review called uh, CRISPR the biggest uh, biotech discovery of the century. The Break and Throw Prize is just one of several prominent uh, awards Dutna has won in recent months for uh, her work on CRISPR, National Public Radio, recently reported whispers of a possible novel in her future. Mm -hmm. Okay, so giving some examples of things that scientists have already been able to do with this tool is um, to repair defective. So defective means if something's wrong with it. So for example, if you buy an electronic device and it is defective it means it doesn't work properly so in terms of DNA that means there's some kind of genetic uh, disorder that they were born with because they had defective DNA so this cured them so they were able to cut out or snip the DNA and replace it and this was able uh, to cure the mice so a genetic disorder lots of different types of uh, genetic disorders all right plant scientists so people who work with plants have used this uh, to edit genes in crops crops means in the food like corn crops wheat soy you know things like that that's those are called crops and so they are raising hopes raising hopes so to raise hope means to increase the hope or to give hope that in the future they will be able to engineer 
a better food supply, so to create. This is a very controversial issue already with GMOs and things like that. So, um, you know, some people really think it's a great idea, and some people think uh, we shouldn't uh, bother nature. <laughs> so it's a, it's a. I'm sure it's going to cause a lot more controversy and debate. All right, some researchers are trying to rewrite the genomes. A genome is the genes, you know, the the gene pool of elephants, and they're trying to recreate this woolly mammoth. So something we believe. Uh, existed in the past, they're trying to recreate it, which means to create again, to produce a woolly mammoth with this gene editing tool. All right, so we have these other uh, researchers in, in Japan. Uh, let's see, they predicted, which means that they're guessing, you know, using an educated guess that in the future uh, they're going to be able to use this to alter. That means to change, to transform the genes of human embryos. So you guys, I think, know what embryos are when you're first starting, you know, as a little tiny embryo and before you're really even a baby. So they're going to do this very quickly in the immediate future. All right, so this has been known as one of the biggest biotech discoveries of the century. So um, the accolades means the recognition, the, the, you know, the applause. When you get accolades, it means people recognize you and give you recognition and they tell you how great this is, you know. So a lot of people are giving them accolades, is that's how you say that, and they've been winning a lot of uh, prominent awards, significant, important, uh, special awards. Maybe even possibly they will win. There's reported whispers. That means people are talking. Uh, maybe they'll win the Nobel Prize. Okay. All right, so interesting. Okay, Emrahan. Starting from even yeah. the pharmaceutical industry. Okay. Even the pharmaceutical industry, which is often slow to embrace, embrace new scientific advances, is rushing to get in on the act. New companies developing CRISPR-based medicine are opening their doors. In January, the pharmaceutical Pharmaceutical. 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 Giant. Mm -hmm. Giant. No artist announced that it would be using Dogna's CRSPR technology for its research into cancer treatment. It plans to edit the genes of immune cells so they so that they will attack tumors. Mm -hmm. But admit all the black tie colors and patient feelings, it is easy to overlook the most important fact about CRISPR. Nobody actually invented it. Dodna and other researchers didn't pluck the molecules uh, mm -hmm. they use for gene editing from thin air. In fact, they stumbled uh, across the stumbled across the CP CRSPR molecules in nature. Aha, uh -huh. okay, good. Uh, some good things here. All right, the pharmaceutical industry means the drug industry, <laughs> the, the industry of companies that make pharmaceuticals, which are also known as medications, drugs, things like that. Okay, so it's a huge industry, obviously. Um, so the, what this article is saying that they are often slow to embrace new scientific advances. So the industry uh, is slow to embrace. It means slow to kind of want to accept this, to understand it, to want to use it in their businesses. So to embrace means to hug, but in this case it means to to want to use it. You know, like if I hear about a new uh, scientific research, I think, okay, well, I'll see. I don't necessarily want to create a whole new business around it, you know, or have it affect my business until I, I really know about it. So uh, just because there are scientific advances, meaning, you know, new research showing something, they're usually slow, but, um, but they are rushing into the act. So it's rushing to get in on the act. That's an expression to get in on the act. Um, they're, they're saying usually they're slow, but now they're seeing how amazing this could be. So they're rushing, they're hurrying, they're, you know, with a lot of speed, they're quick 
to get in on the act, which means like they want a piece of the action. They want to use this technology for their own, uh, obviously, business uh, purposes. So they can make some money, do some things, that kind of stuff. So some new companies are even being uh, created. They are opening their doors. When a new company opens their doors, it means they, they've just been created. So some new companies are, you know, some investors are probably saying, hey, let's, let's you know, start a business and use this, this technology. So uh, pharmaceutical giant Norvatis, their big pharmaceutical company, they announced, which means they told people they're going to be using this technology for research in, into cancer treatments. And so what they plan to do is to edit the genes of immune cells, so the cells that you know fight disease, so that they can go and attack the tumor. So they're wanting to use this to help uh, cure people of cancer. Um, all right, so amid here means just whenever you're amid a group, so in this case the black tie galas and patent filings, this means you know amid or uh, in the middle of all of these uh, parties that they're having where people are wearing black ties, that's what a gala or a gala or a gala is a big party where you dress up. So they've been going to all of these and some researchers and businesses are filing patents. A patent is something like specific to you, your invention and then nobody can copy you. So they're re um, hurrying up, they're rushing to try to file patents. Um, they said it's easy to overlook. So to overlook something means to not notice it. So they're not paying attention to some um, important fact about this uh, technique is that nobody actually invented it. So no person actually came up with it. In fact, uh, they did not pluck the molecules. To pluck means to pick. So when you pluck the feathers of a chicken, you're picking the feathers off of the chicken, you know, to eat it, that kind of thing. To pluck, they didn't pluck the molecules they use from thin air. So it's not like they just discovered it on their own. They stumbled across. That means they you know, to stumble means to kind of fall, like you're going to fall down. You stumble across somebody something means you find it. So they actually found these molecules in nature. So it was just something that they observed. They didn't uh, create it actually. Okay, let's uh, hear some more, Diana. Starting from microbes all the way to yet there. Diana, your microphone is muted. Can you guys hear me? Okay. okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> uh, microbes have been using them to edit their own DNA for millions of years. And today they continue to do so all over the planet, from the bottom of the sea to the recess of our our bodies. We uh, we barely began to understand how Christ works in the natural world. Microbes use use it as a sophisticated immune system, allowing them to learn to recognize their enemies. How sci scientists are discovering that microbes use crisps for other worlds as well. The natural history of scripts poses many questions to scientists for, for which they don't have very good answers yet. But it also holds great promise. promise. Don't and her colleagues harness one type of crisp by scientists are finding a vast menagerie mm -hmm. of the different types. Tapping that diversity could lead to more effectively gen editing technology or open the way to application no one has thought of yet. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, so microbes, these microorganisms, have been using them. Using what? They've been using molecules already, the CRISPR molecules, okay? They've already been using these types of molecules to edit their own DNA. So in nature, uh, our cells have already been having this uh, DNA editing process for millions of years. Maybe that's the idea of you know evolution or something. Um, so today they continue to do so, I mean to continue to do that editing process all over the planet. Uh, and then she just says from the bottom of the sea 
to the recesses of our own bodies. The recesses just means the areas, the areas of our own body, inside our own bodies. Uh, we've barely begun. So barely means just like, you know, we're just now starting to understand. It's very new that we're understanding how these molecules work in the natural world. Um, so microbes, they use a sophisticated immune system. Your immune system is the, the, the what we call the the parts that fight against a like a foreign object, a virus, a bacteria, a disease, things like that. And sophisticated means you know very complicated, not simple. So the opposite of sophisticated would be simple. Sophisticated is complex, you know. Um, and so it allows them to learn, to recognize, to understand, and to see who the enemies are. So our bodies, these cells, you know, the microbes, uh, in living things. Uh, they recognize the enemies. They see this is not supposed to be here, right? Okay, and then they start. They take action, that kind of thing. Um, they're learning. So scientists are still discovering all these new things about these uh, CRISPR uh, molecules that they're used they're for other jobs as well. So they do other things as well. Um, let's do, do, do poses a question. So if you pose a question, it means you're it puts a question to these. Uh, scientists. It means it's like asking, it's um, putting in front of them these questions. They don't know. These scientists don't really know, so they're trying to discover more and more. And they don't have good answers yet. Um, but it has great promise. Promise means that you're hopeful that something good will come in the future. So um, they don't know everything, but they're very hopeful that they're going to learn more and more. And that you know, with this CRISPR, they are going to have lots of uh, amazing things they can do. That's the idea. Okay, her colleagues harnessed to harness something means to kind of like take control of it. So they are able to uh, see and kind of take control of just one type of CRISPR. But scientists are finding a vast. A vast means a large, a large or a wide menagerie. Oh, it means um, you know when you think of a large group. Of different types, so a menagerie is like a, a group, but a, a lot of different things. So you can imagine this is just the beginning of what they're discovering. Now they're realizing, wow, there's so many of these different types of things that we could use. So um, when you tap, tapping that diversity could lead. So tapping the diversity, what is the diversity? This, the menagerie of different types. So that diversity could lead to. Which means could you know help them get to be able to do this gene editing process even more effectively as they understand how it's already been going on in nature. So that would open the way to application. So that would allow them to apply other techniques, you know, that they haven't even thought of yet. So scientists have even more to discover and to figure out. Um, to open the way for something just means to allow it to happen. All right, so I'll just read this part. Uh, you can imagine that many labs, including our own, are busily looking at other variants and how they work, Dudna says, said. So stay tuned. <laughs> so uh, her lab is looking at you know, all these different types, and that's the variant, a, a variation, and how they might work. And so she says stay tuned, which just means you know, keep listening to what we tell you about what we're discovering because it's going to be... Um, New things. All right, so a repeat mystery. Let's start there with Antonio. Why don't you read all? Let's see. Okay. All of that. Yeah. I can see the screen. Okay. A repeat mystery. The scientists who discovered CRASPR had no way of knowing that they had discovered something so revolutionary. They didn't even understand what they had found. In 1987, Yosuzumi Ishino and college at Osaka University in Japan published the sequence of a gene called EAE, belonging to the good microbe E. coli. To better understand how the gene worked, the scientists also sequenced uh, some of the DNA surrounding it. They hoped to find spots where Proteins landed turning EAP on and off. But instead of a switch, 
the scientists found something incomprehensible. If you, you've eaten yogurt or cheese, chances are you have eaten sea earth is sp earth is cells. Near the EAP gen lay five identical segments of DNA. DNA is made up of building blocks called bases and five segments were each composed of the same 20, 29 bases. These repeat sequences were separated from each other by 32 base blocks of DNA called spacers. Unlike the repeat sequences, each of the spacers have a unique sequence. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, <laughs> let me explain some things. Okay, the, those scientists who discovered this, and I put a link to it so there's a little picture there. Maybe we could understand better because this is definitely a scientific uh, topic here. Um, they had no way of knowing. So they didn't know that they had just discovered something so revolutionary. So with the, you know, revolutionary means the possibility of, of massive change, you know. Um, they didn't even understand what they had found. Uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. They were um, they published the sequence of a gene. So this is uh, what they find when you have a genes, and then there's like a sequence, um, and they have names for all this stuff, of course. And so they called it the IAP, and this belongs to um, the gut microbe E. coli. So E. coli, you might be familiar with, is the the gut microbe that uh, makes people very sick. Um, actually, my daughter had E. coli when she was two, and she was very sick, but she didn't die. Some people actually die, um, but it can be very dangerous. So some people, you know, researchers are working on that to try to figure out how to, you know, get rid of it or help people who have it, that type of thing. All right, so they were trying to understand how the gene worked. Um, so they also sequenced some of the DNA that was surrounding the, the, you know, the E. coli, this sequence of gene here in E. coli. All right, what they hoped to find were spots, spots or areas, we say, an area, where proteins landed. Landed here means where they, like, attach, I guess. And so they wanted to figure out how to turn this IAP sequence on and off, or how they wanted to understand how it is done you know, in nature, how it, they turn it on and off. That's how they talk about genes. Some get switched on or switched off. And then if you have a switched on, that can have a consequence or switched off, the same kind of thing. Okay, so but instead of a switch, like a, you know, like a light switch where you turn something on or off, they found something incomprehensible, something they could not understand. Uh, and then they just throw this in here. <laughs> if we've eaten yogurt or cheese, you've had a crisper, crisperized cell. All right, so we that means we've had some cells that have had this process done to it, so this editing of the gene. So near the IAP gene lay five. So near this gene there are, lay just means you know that's where they're located, they're sitting right there next to them. Remember this is all very tiny stuff you can't see with your eyes, so they're looking through microscopes to discover this. Um, and they have identical segments, so identical meaning the same, segment meaning portion of DNA. So the DNA is made up of they call building blocks. So if you think of like Legos or something when you're a kid, you're building, you're using these blocks to build something bigger with Legos. They call these building blocks in um, uh, science bases. And so the five segments were each composed of the same 29 bases. Uh, so they're just explaining they, uh, the sequence, what it looked like. They were repeated and they were separated from each other by these things called spacers. So this is uh, the 32 base blocks of DNA called spacers. A spacer like, is a, just another term they're using. In general, a spacer gives you space between one set of things and then the next set of things. But unlike the repeat sequences, each of the spacers had a unique sequence. So this was something that was the new thing. That each spacer had a different and special, unique sequence. It, they weren't all the same. That was kind of the new discovery that they realized, which was surprising to them. Okay, Amparo. All of this. Okay. This peculiar uh, genetic sandwich didn't look like anything biology had found before. When the Japanese researchers published their results, they could only shrug. 
uh, the biological significance of these sequences is not known, they wrote. It was hard to know at the time if the sequences were unique to E. coli because microbi microbiologists only had good techniques for deciphering DNA. But in the 90, 90s, uh, technological advances allow them to speed up their sequencing. By the end of the decade, microbi uh, microbiologists uh, could scoop up uh, water or soil and quickly sequence much of the DNA in the sample. This technique, called metagenomics, mm -hmm. revealed those strange genetic sandwiches in a staggering number of the species of microbes. They became so common that scientists need, needed a name to talk about them, even if they still did not know what the sequences were for. In 2002, Wood Jensen of Utrecht University in the Netherlands and colleagues dubbed these sandwiches clustered regularly in their spade short <laughs> permit, repeat. Yeah. Repeat for short. <laughs> yeah, now we finally know what they're talking about. Okay. Okay, so this peculiar, that means like kind of strange. If something is peculiar, it means you're not used to it, you're, you, it looks strange to you, different, new, weird, um, and it looked like this, you know, sandwich. So sandwich meaning here like push together whenever you sw sandwich something together, that could be a, you know, a verb, not just like a sandwich that you eat, but to sandwich something together means to put it uh, together. So this genetic sandwich of all these genes uh, together didn't look like anything they had found before. Uh, and so basically they could only shrug. That means like lift your shoulders up and then go like, I don't know. <laughs> like I don't know what this stuff is. And so they didn't really understand the significance. You know, what, what, why, why was it like this? You know, why, why? They didn't know. They couldn't understand. All right, so they didn't really know if it was just related to E. coli or did this happen in you know other microbes, that kind of thing. So microbiologists, the biologists that study these very tiny little units of living matter, um, they only had crude techniques. So crude means like um, not very high level, you know, very very basic. Like when you're first building a technology, we call it crude. It's just getting started. So they were using these crude, you know, very new but not very high tech uh, techniques for deciphering. So for understanding, when you decipher something, it's like take it apart and understand it so that you can figure out what it means. So they're trying to understand DNA, but their technology wasn't very good. Uh, then there were some advances allowed them to speed up their sequencing, so to make it go faster, make it go quicker. Uh, and so by the end of the decade they could scoop up, that means like if you go to a pond and you just have a little cup or something, you dip your cup in and that's called scooping up. So you dip your cup or bucket or something into the pond or to the ocean and you gather up some seawater or you know some dirt, some soil and then using the technology you could quickly sequence the DNA in the sample, the sample of water or dirt or whatever. So this technique is what they call uh, metagenomics and it also revealed, so it showed these strange, these peculiar genetic sa uh, sandwiches in a staggering number. So a lot of them. If something is staggering, it's like, whoa, there's a lot here. It's a kind of an overwhelming number. So lots and lots of uh, uh, species had these genetic sandwiches. And so they needed to figure out a way to talk about them. They had, they had to give them a name. Even though they didn't know what it was or what it was for, they didn't understand it they ended up giving it this name. So clustered, meaning when something is clustered together, it's all together. Like if people are really cold and they, they come together to try to get warm, they huddle together. We call that like a cluster. And so these uh, genes were clustered regularly interspaced. So they had uh, to interspace means to put something in between the spaces. And then short palindromic repeats. So if you look at the, the Wikipedia page that I linked, there's like a picture of what that kind of looks like. So they just gave it that name. So it's CRISPR for short, and then people, scientists, understand what they're talking about, even though they didn't know what they were actually, uh, what they were, were for, they just gave them a name, you know. We're just going to call them this. So that's what they called them. Okay. All right, back to you, Monica.
Jessa's team noticed something else about the crisp sequences. They were always accompan accompanied by a collection of genes nearby. They called these genes CAS genes for crisp associated genes. The genes encoded enzyme enzymes that enzyme. could cut enzymes uh -huh. that could cut DNA, but no one could say why they did so or why they always sat next to the CRISP sequence. Three years later, three teams of scientists independently noticed something odd about CRISP spacers. They looked a lot like the DNA of viruses. And then the whole thing clicked, said Eugene Kunan. At the time, Conin, an evolutionary biologist at the National Center for Biotechnology Information in Petersdorf, had been puzzling over CRISP and the CAS genes, genes for a, a few years. As soon as he learned of the discovery of bits of virus DNA in CRISP spaces, he realized that the micro microbes were using CRISP as a weapon against the viruses. Kunin knew that microbes are not passive victims of virus attacks. They have several lines of defense. Kunin thought that CRISPs and the CAS en enzymes provide one more. In Kuhn's hypo hypothesis, bacteria use CAS en enzymes to grab fragments of viral DNA. Mm -hmm. Okay, now we're getting a little more technical. <laughs> okay, so they noticed. Yeah. <laughs> they noticed, <laughs> so they saw. That means they saw something, uh, something else, you know, about these sequences. So now we know that these were these clusters of uh, genes that were there, and that they were always accompanied by. So they always came together with this other cluster or collection of genes that were nearby to them. So, uh, and they called these the Cas genes. So it's like CRISPR associated genes. For um, they called it Cas genes. So you're taking from the C here, and then associated here. So these came along, kind of like they came together as a package it sounds like, and the genes encoded enzymes. So they like created these enzymes that could cut DNA. So to cut, to snip DNA, which okay, that's now they're trying to understand that. They could observe that, but no one could say why. Why would they do this? Um, but they always sat next to or you know were collected nearby this sequence. So uh, they keep discovering things independently. So each you know different teams of scientists working not together. When you work independently, you're working in your own team, not with another team. So independently, they all were noticing the same kind of thing, something odd, something strange about these uh, spacers. They looked a lot like the DNA of viruses. So we say not virus, but uh, we say viruses with the long I sound. Um, and then the whole thing clicked, means like, oh, now we understand. Okay, now they're understanding what's going on. So the evolutionary biologist, uh, somebody who studies the evolution of living organisms, um, in Bethesda, and this is short for Maryland, that's a state in the United States. So Bethesda, Maryland, near Washington, D.C., has a lot of uh, you know national institutes and things like that uh, related to the government. Um, they had been puzzling over. When you puzzle over something, it's like you're thinking about it, but you don't know the answer. You're you're str kind of struggling with trying to figure out something. So you're puzzling over, trying to figure out what these things are all about. So they'd been studying this for a while, and then they learned. Um, of the discovery of bits of virus DNA. So little parts, little bit, you know, little part of virus DNA was inside these uh, spacers. So what they realized, what they thought was, okay, these CRISPR are weapons against the virus. So that's the main thing. Even if we don't understand all the technical things, basically they just found that this portion of the, the sequence here was fighting viruses. Um, they knew that they weren't passive victims. They didn't just, you know, sit there and do nothing, they actually were the defense. So they were providing defense for the organism um, by, you know, create, by attacking these uh, viruses. All right, so let's see, by did you use cast enzyme to grab fragments of viral DNA. So it's, a, it's, a, it's your body, let's say in a human being, 
is already going in to grab means to you know, like to to with your hands we would grab like you know a glass off the the counter or something off the table so what this is what this is doing these genes are going and getting the bits these fragments of the virus the viral DNA so they're trying to fight uh, you know the invaders into the space <laughs> that's kind of the idea that metaphor for what happens in your body when you have a bite uh, virus okay let's keep going uh, they then uh, insert the virus uh, fragments into their own crystal sequences later when another virus comes along the bacteria can use the CRISPR sequence as a cheat uh, sheet to recognize the invader scientists didn't know enough about the function of CRISPR and uh, cas enzymes uh, for cloning to make a detailed uh, hypothesis. But his uh, thinking was uh, provocative enough for a microbiologist named Rodolf Barango to test it. To Barango, Kunin's idea was not uh, just uh, fascinating, but potentially a huge deal for his employer at the time, the yogurt maker uh, Denisco. <laughs> Denisco depended on a bacteria to convert milk into yogurt and sometimes entire cultures would be lost uh, to outbreaks of, of bacteria killing viruses. Now Kunin was, uh, was suggesting that bacteria could use CRISPR as a weapon against these enemies. To test uh, Kunin's uh, hypothesis, Berengo and uh, his colleagues infected the uh, milk uh, fermenting microbe Secret uh, Tocus Thermophilus with uh, two strains of viruses. Mm -hmm. You can read this last one too here. Uh, the viruses killed uh, many of the uh, bacteria, but some survived. When those uh, resistant bacteria multiplied, their uh, descendants uh, turned out to be resistant uh, to some genetic uh, change had occurred. Mm -hmm. Okay, all right, so here they're trying to figure out what is happening, how is this working, so they insert, which means to put in uh, these virus fragments into their own CRISPR sequences. All right, so that's how they're uh, kind of uh, taking these viral fragments and putting them into this sequence here. The, the microbe itself is doing this, not the scientists. Um, and then what happens naturally when another virus comes along, so uh, you, you catch another virus or something, the bacteria can use this sequence as a cheat sheet. A cheat sheet is when you you know you write down the the information that you need to remember so that you can recognize something. So if you use a cheat sheet for a test, you've written down like all the formulas you need or something. So it's it's like learning, you know. So now you can recognize this invader. Like oh, I've had this virus before. This is what we we do when we have this virus. Okay. Um, all right. So they didn't know enough about the function, how it worked. In order, to, you know, they couldn't really make a very detailed hypothesis. But uh, this thing happened with the yogurt maker. All right. So um, what happened was that they know that, you know, to make yogurt, you need bacteria. You have to convert. You have to change the milk into yogurt using some bacteria. They call that an, a culture. You know, you turn, you put a culture with some heated up milk, and then it turns into eventually over time into yogurt. Um, but they would be lost to outbreaks of bacteria killing viruses. So sometimes, you know, this company they would lose their culture because a virus would come into the, you know, the factory or something where they were making the yogurt and it would kill the the different uh, bacteria that they needed to make the yogurt. So he wanted Kunin, the scientist, was suggesting that bacteria could use CRISPR as a weapon against these enemies, so the virus, you know. Um, all right, so they tested their hypothesis. They, they did an experiment, and his colleagues infected the milk fermenting microbe. And this is a, a kind of a common yogurt making uh, enzyme here, Streptococcus thermophilus, with two sprains of ice. So they basically made it sick. You know, <laughs> they made this uh, bacterial culture sick with the virus, and the viruses killed many of the bacteria. So that's what they thought. But some, survived so they didn't have a total wipeout uh, and so then those were called uh, resistant bacteria when they resist so they're not getting killed by 
the, bi the virus, and then they multiply. It's like they have babies, you know. They're multiplying, and so the descendants, we call that like the babies, you know, <laughs> your descendants, um, they also were resistant. So they were no longer going to be affected by those viruses that were had killed the other ones. So that meant there had been some type of genetic change. So that was really important. They were trying to understand how basically like immunity gets passed around. So uh, Barangu and his colleagues. All right, let's keep going. Emerhan. Starting from Barango and his colleagues. Oh. Found. Okay. Barango and his colleagues uh, found that the bacteria had stopped DNA fr fragments from the two viruses into their spacers. When the scientists chopped out the new spacers, the bacteria lost their resistance. Barango now an associate professor at North Carolina State University said that this discovery led many manufacturers to select for customized crisis sequences in their culture so that the bacteria could withstand virus outbreaks. If you have eaten yogurt or cheese, Chances are you have eaten crisprized crisp, crisp cells, he said, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. cut and paste, as crisprized started to give up its secrets, Dodna got curious. She had already made a name for herself as an expert on RNA, a single stranded cousin to DNA, original scientists had seen RNA's main job as a messenger. Cells would make a copy of a gene using RNA and then use that messenger RNA as a template for building a protein. But Dodna and other scientists illuminated many other jobs that RNA can do such as acting as sensors or controlling the activity of genes. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. All right, so I um, want to hurry up here. Okay, <laughs> let's see. So basically it led them to believe that you know, they could uh, help the, the cultures uh, so that the bacteria could withstand, so could stand up to. So to withstand something means you, you're okay. So you have a virus outbreak but you don't get ill and die. We're talking about the, the cultures here <laughs> for yogurt making. Uh, and so this is how this researcher lady got curious. She was working actually with RNA. So as opposed to DNA, RNA is a single strand. So it's, it's a similar kind of thing happening in you know, a living organism, but it's, it's a little bit different than the DNA. And so uh, she had seen the RNA's main job as a messenger, so to, to tell, you know, that sells these different things, right? So, um, let's see, they were using it as a template for building protein, but she and other scientists illuminated, that means they showed, you know, they highlighted that the RNA also had many other jobs. Uh, it could con act as a sensor, you know, sensing things, and also controlling the activities of the genes. All right, so I'm going to read this real quick. In 2007, Blake Wiedenheff joined Dudna's lab as a postdoctoral researcher eager to study the structure of Cas enzymes to understand how they work. All right, so they agreed to the plan. She agreed to the plan, not because she thought CRISPR had any practical value, but because just because she thought the chemistry might be cool. So she wasn't really, you know, that interested, but kind of cool. You're not trying to get to a particular goal, except understanding, she said. So as Whedon Heft, Dudna, and their colleagues figured out the structure of Cas enzymes, they began to see how the molecules work together as a system. So they understand now better. When a virus invades a microbe, the host cell grabs a little of the virus's genetic material, cuts open its own DNA, and inserts the piece of virus DNA into a spacer. So they're watching how this works when you get when your cell, you know, comes across a virus. Okay, Antonio, why don't you read? Uh, just that little bit there, and then we'll give Amparo. Oh, Amparo, why don't you read that little bit? Okay. At the, at the CRISPR 
region uh, fields with viral DNA, it becomes a molecular most wanted gallery, representing the enemies the microbe have encountered. The microbe can then use this viral DNA to turn cast enzymes into precision guided weapons. The microbe copies the genetic material in each spacer into um, a RNA molecule. Cas uh, enzymes uh, then take up one of the RNA molecules and cradle it. Together, the viral RNA and the Cas enzymes drive it through the cells. If they encounter genetic material for a virus that matches the CRISPR RAM, <laughs> RNA latched on tightly. <laughs> the Cas enzymes and then chop the DNA in two preventing the virus from replicating. Mm -hmm. As CRISPR's uh, biology emerged, it began to uh, to make other microbial defenses look downright primitive. Using CRISPR's microbe could even in effect program their enzymes to seek out any short sequences of the DNA and attack attack it exclusively. exclusively. Okay, all right, we, we ran out of time. But anyways, they're just explaining how they observe this, how it works, and there are some pictures online if you want to like a, a, a graphic of how this is working, but it's it's an amazing thing because it's our, the, the nature itself is, this is how nature itself tries to deal with uh, invaders, kind of like a virus or something. So, you know, there's some words here. Replicating means copying, you know, pre preventing the virus from replicating itself. So they chop the DNA into, they cut it in, in half. And so it's pretty cool. I wanted to at least introduce it to you guys. I, I knew it was a really long article. Um, if you're interested, it is kind of technical, but if you just kind of follow the main ideas, you don't necessarily have to understand, you know, RNA and Cas enzymes that kind of stuff, but the kind of the process and the fact that it, it can edit. And now will humans be able to kind of take control of this natural process and use it uh, in ways to engineer new, uh, you know, organisms, DNA, things like this. That's kind of the idea. So if you're interested, you can keep reading. Otherwise, uh, you might want to read it in your own language and then come back, and that would, might help you to better understand it as well. And if you look at the pictures on the, the site where I got it, those are pretty interesting uh, pictures as well. That's the lady there. But in terms of these pictures where you actually see uh, inside, um, right here, there's a video there. You can see also the DNA sequencing and all that kind of stuff. OK, cool. Well, thanks for coming, you guys. <laughs> Take care. All right. Take care. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome.